The Beatles are the nothing personal word of the day for September 21st, 2022. So many Beatles songs from the catalog. And this is a special show, number 666. Can you believe we've been doing 666 of these episodes, Coco, with no end in sight? And we're trying something that technologically I would not be able to do, but I think it's going to work. So word of the day, the Beatles, if you play this episode backwards, we have a message for you. So try that. 666, the devil. There's a lot of devils out there. As a matter of fact, throughout this show, you're going to hear the theme of this show is the devil. The greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince people he didn't exist. The current devils we have are not very good at being devils because they make no secret of the fact that they exist. So listen to the show forwards and backwards today for the next 44.26 minutes. And you're going to hear and then decide for yourself, who's the biggest D-O-D, the devil of the day. Let's start with corporate greed. It's always a good one. Good topic. The reason the Beatles are the word of the day is they've got a song that I really like. Help Miranda, help, help Miranda, get her out of my life, heart. So, I would sing that song often when I needed something, no matter what I've been doing in my life, since I was in school, raise your hand, help me, and I would sing that to teachers, help me, help me, she said, or I'll, there's, a, there's like a camp song, help me, help me, help me, he said, or I'll make you, it's Little Rabbit Foo Foo, any parents out there know what I'm talking about? Little rabbit foo-foo walking down the forest, like popping down the field mice to knocking them on the head. I'll give you three chances to watch Aaron Judge hit his 61st home run. After that, we are cut off and you will no longer be able to watch baseball in your local market. Man, that was an awkward transition. Sorry, Coca. Yikes. <laughs> Here's the story. There's a man named Brady and they've got 21 very lovely stations. And these stations show your team in your market. If you're in Florida, it's called Bally Sports Florida. You can be anywhere, Bally Sports Ohio. You're watching the Reds, you're watching the Marlins, you're watching the Braves. These are called regional sports networks. They used to be owned back a long time ago you can trace them all the way back to the Bill Parcells coaching tree. <laughs> Sorry. I've always wanted to say that. There's all these trees in sports that they call them. And it, like a coach who's old, they give him a coaching tree. And then all of a sudden you find out there's 49 head coaches that come out of one tree, like a family tree. Like now in baseball with the new hiring of the Tigers, President of Baseball Ops, they're calling it the Theo Epstein tree. And then there's an Andrew Friedman tree that's beginning to bloom. The David Sampson tree, that's a good one. It's D-E-A triple D. Help me is what people are saying under that tree. So... Way back in the beginning, you had Cablevision. Then you had Fox. Fox was not a devil. I used to think that they were difficult to work with, but I loved it. Shout out to you, Jeff Krolik. I know you're listening. Negotiate with them in California, right on the Fox lot. You see all the movie sets, and you knock on the door, and you say, hey, give me more money. We want a bigger TV deal. You see, for teams like the Marlins, the Yankees, the Dodgers, anybody, you are getting a ton of your revenue from your broadcast of your local games. Not like football, when there's no local broadcast revenue and you're splitting national broadcast revenue. In baseball, while the national broadcast revenue deals are nice, the local broadcast revenue deals are nicer. You're offering stations 162 days three hours plus of programming, it's like 500 hours of programming during the summer months when often there's not much else going on. So teams get a lot of money 
Fox was giving out contracts left, right, and center. They were giving $100 million up front. You want to sign Delgado? You got it. We'll give you money up front. You want to sign another player? We'll renegotiate your deal. You want to own a piece of the network? Outstanding. We'll give you an equity profit participation in your network. And then on top of that, we'll do some other funny accounting where we'll hide as much money as possible from revenue sharing. Oh, yeah, that happened. Attention, all Kmart executives. Baseball front offices would go to RSNs to negotiate deals that would find a way to get around your revenue sharing rules. Knowing that they'd have to go before a committee made up of owners called the Revenue Sharing Committee where they would decide what the imputed amount of your TV deal was. If you're the Boston Red Sox and you own your TV station, or you're the New York Yankees and you own your TV station, baseball is going to decide how much money that station should be paying the Yankees. So that amount of money is in the Yankees local revenue and that amount of money is shared in revenue sharing. Fascinating negotiation. Let's pretend that the Yankees TV network every year, the Yes Network makes $500 million. And then they pay the Yankees $100 million. And they profit 400. The $400 million profit of the Yes Network does not get shared with other teams. The $100 million that the Yankees have goes into the Yankees calculation of the amount of revenue sharing they pay. The low revenue teams say, excuse me, that doesn't seem fair. The Yankees are really getting the 400 in profit plus the 100. They're getting it all. We're not sharing in that. We are filing a grievance, an appeal. Mr. Commissioner, will you set up a committee that can be the final arbiter on whether or not the Yankees TV deal is quote unquote fair market? It's the biggest bunch of horse hockey in the history of baseball where these committees who would decide what the fair market value was for a particular TV deal. Total manipulation, total side deals. It was high drama and hysterical. I guess not that funny when you're getting revenue sharing, but really funny when you're saving revenue sharing. But for fans, they look at it and say, eh, I just want to watch the games. Could you work on the local blackout issue? Because I can't stand the fact that I can't watch games in my own market of my own team. Now, nah, we're not going to work on that. We're working on the other part of the money. So Fox has all of these networks. And then one day, something very weird happened. All of you said, cable? Cable? What do I need cable for? I don't wanna have to meet Jim Carrey in a dark alley. I am gonna snip it like a moil. Snipping the cord means that you no longer have a cord coming out of your wall though it could be ethernet. What it means is that you have a smart device, whether it's a TV or a laptop, and you are getting streaming services, Hulu, YouTube, Netflix, name them all. Instead of having to buy a cable package where you've got to deal with being on hold for 42 minutes, when you've got to deal with equipment, when you've got to deal with wires, when you've got to deal with buying channels that you don't want, now you get the streaming services you do want, the channels you do want. You can buy it a la carte. Snippage. Uh-oh. The reason that Fox was able to give so much money to teams is they were getting so much money from you. They would say, nah, we're getting it from the cable companies. And the cable companies would say, shh, we're getting it from our customers and we're going to keep a big amount of it and then give the rest to all of the people who make up all this programming. Fox, you can deliver us 500 hours of programming on Fox Sports Florida? Hell yeah, we'll pay you. Marlins, we're gonna need that 500 hours of programming. We're gonna pay you much less. All right, we need it. That is the chain. When you break the chain, the calculation goes bye-bye. 
Fox saw it coming. When we, when we were negotiating, I would go with Michael Hill and Jeff Conine and PJ Loyello, and we would go to the Fox lot and negotiate, trying to get an extension of a TV deal, negotiated a great extension that Jeter decided not to take and then signed his own extension that was for less money than he could have gotten had he paid attention to what we were offering him upon the sale of the franchise. But he said, nah, I'll do more. I said, great, pay me for the amount that you think you're gonna get more because the team's going to be in much better financial shape with you running it than with me running it. <laughs> You're the devil in disguise. I think that's probably what they're saying about me right now in the front office in Derek Jeter's demolished house in Tampa. So Fox says, we have a small problem. We've got a world of snippers now. We no longer are making the money we were making and Big Fox, like Rupert Murdoch style Big Fox said, could you do me a favor and get rid of those RSNs? And Fox said, no problem, we're for sale. And here comes MLB, we'd like to buy those networks. We'd like to own the networks that show the games of our teams. It would be a great way to control our product. Fantabulous. We'll offer you $16 billion, Fox. Are you in? Come on, please. In comes Sinclair, another upstart media company saying, we've got a better plan. We're gonna buy them all and we'll offer you $21 billion. Fox said, huh? That can't be. Sinclair said, we've got it. We're gonna borrow the money. All these banks are so happy to lend us the money because we're getting these networks. And we think the snipping rate is going to slow down and we've got a way to deal with it with streaming. Don't you worry, let us borrow the money, it's gonna be awesome. When companies buy their companies, they don't go to their executives and say, excuse me, can I get into your checking account? What they actually do is say, Mr. Banker, I'd like to borrow a couple bill. Would that be okay? Sure. We're gonna have to charge you 5%, no problem. What about 10%? Ooh, now we're talking about junk status. Have you ever heard about junk bonds? Do you know what a junk bond is? It just means that the interest rate that's being paid by the person who borrows the money is usurious because the odds are they're never gonna repay the money and you're gonna get S-C-R-E-W-E-D by a 666 lover. So Sinclair borrows billions of dollars. They buy the networks for 21 billion. Everything's coming up daisies. But then Fox was right and the clipping continued. And all of a sudden the cable companies were losing money hand over fist and the cable companies were realizing that in order for us to survive, I will survive. They're gonna have to make streaming networks that they control. They're gonna have to merge, consolidate. But man, oh man, the days of basic cable and tiered cable and cable plus and get me that sports channel. Oh, I'll take that channel too and that channel too. I'm happy to pay for channels I'm not watching. Nope. Day is done. Gone the RSNs. What do we do? Holy crap. The people who lent the money to Sinclair said, hi. Would you start paying us back? Sinclair said, yikes, we're not making close to the amount of money we thought we were gonna make. We can't afford to pay the debt service on all the money that we borrowed. The banks say, well, guess what? You're about to go bankrupt. Major League Baseball says, uh-oh, we have a problem. If Sinclair goes bankrupt, our fans won't get to watch our games. I have a surprise for all of you. That's not true. If Sinclair goes into liquidation, bankruptcy, the games will still be broadcast, you'll still get to watch. But guess what won't happen? The rights fees won't get paid to the teams. The teams will have cash flow issues that will have to be covered by all the money that MLB keeps from its central revenue, broadcast revenue nationally, all of the national sponsors, and all the money that should go to teams and distributions that they keep for a rainy day. Well, it is raining cats, dogs, and clippers right now. 
because Sinclair is done. They have to sell every one of the networks. They renamed them Bally's, so you can look for that in your local area. But Sinclair has to sell them all. And guess who's going to buy them? Nobody. So MLB said, wait a minute. Why don't we buy it? We can buy it for cents on the dollar, and then we will control everything. We can change the blackout rules. We can change territories. We can start our own streaming network. This would be amazing. Is Bob Bowman still with baseball? That's an inside joke. There's an entire company to be formed here and Major League Baseball, the NBA and the NHL are very likely going to combine and offer to buy all of the RSNs. They're not going to pay 21 billion. They're not going to pay 11 billion. You're lucky if they pay 1 billion. It's one of the great write-offs in Sinclair's history. It's been an unmitigated disaster and Fox is laughing all the way to the bank. But for all of you, there's panic in the air that you will not be able to watch Aaron Judge. I promise you, there will never be, this is not even a wait to see. There will never be an interruption in your ability to watch Aaron Judge go for the home run record. He hit his 60th last night. It's pretty good. What a ninth inning for the Yankees. Stanton hits a walk-off grand slam. You should hope that Stanton gets hot if you're a Yankee fan. Because having Judge hit home runs, that's nice. But not having length in the lineup means you're not going to get through October. Of course, they have some pitching issues too. But that said, they need John Holmes to start pitching better, I'll tell you that. Aaron Judge hit 60. He's now tied Babe Ruth. It's crazy what we're seeing. It's taken this long, but this year, Babe Ruth must be, I don't know what's going on wherever he is. He's definitely having some cocktails. But what I can promise you is that his pitching and hitting records are under assault by the two MVP candidates in the American League. Otani's doing things that haven't been done since Ruth. Judge is doing things that are making Ruth say, oh, I guess I'm finally moving down the list. And next comes Maris. So when you go to games and you have a chance to catch Pools' 700th or catch Judge's 61st or 62nd, do yourself a favor. Buy a ticket and go to the ballpark and sit in the outfield. What other event can you go to where you have a chance to win the lottery? I mean, you can go to a, a convenience store and buy a lottery ticket, but the odds are like one in 300 million. If you go sit in the outfield, then the odds are like one in 4,000. That seems awesome, assuming he hits at that game. So the guy who caught the 60th last night was pretty funny. He wanted to give it back to Judge because at the end of the day, what's it really gonna be worth? There are people who speculate it could be worth like half a million dollars. My advice to you, if you catch any of Judge's next balls, I mean batted balls, baseballs, don't give it back to the Yankees. Don't trade it for jerseys and photos and bats and season tickets. Keep it. Call your accountant. Call your lawyer. If you don't have one, find a friend who does and then maximize that value. Why not? If you catch number 61 that ties Roger Maris, do you know that you have an opportunity to maybe make a million bucks and you're worried about going on StubHub to spend 300 on a ticket? That seems like a decent investment. You get to go to a game, you may not get a ball, but you're at a cool game. And if you catch 62, uh-oh. That could be worth millions of dollars. Now, 63, 64, 65, not as much. If you catch the last one of the season, that's a big one. Not as big as 62. That's the Yankee and the American record, the American League record. So one of the things that people are now trying to calculate is 
if you had a chance to catch both Aaron Judge's 62nd and Albert Pujols' 700th, which would you rather catch? If you're deciding whether to fly and follow the Yankees or fly and follow the Cardinals, who would you and who should you fly and follow? It's the easiest math equation ever. The Cardinals. I don't think people understand the likelihood of another player to hit 700 home runs. Here's what it is. 0.00. I'm talking Blutarski's GPA. Is there a chance that another hitter will match Aaron Judge, another Yankee hitter? Stanton hit 59 for the Marlins, winning the MVP in 17. Yeah, got tons of attention. <laughs> Nothing. He did win the MVP. That was sort of cool, though. That was my last year in baseball. Ended it on a great note with him winning the MVP. You don't think Stan could come around next year and hit 63 home runs? 64? Yes, he definitely could. By far. So, I'd follow Pujols. The 700th ball is going to be worth way more than the Aaron Judge 62nd ball. Okay. Oh, we're going to take a break. We come back. We're going to review a movie that Coca asked me to watch. I did, and I can't wait to talk about it. And then we're going to continue our conversation about the devil. You are listening to episode six. Six. Six of Nothing Personal. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's September 21st, 2022. My name is David Sampson, and you have found us. Come back tomorrow, and you're going to hear an amazing 45-minute conversation with Jason Caldwell from the movie Chasing that we reviewed this week, the man who holds the world record for rowing across the Atlantic. Come back Friday, and you're going to get a mailbag episode. Come back Monday, and you're going to get crickets. It's the new year, and we'll be back with another episode like this on Tuesday. So I'm going to have plenty of time to watch movies this weekend as I try to navigate a marathon, not having run in two months since Kilimanjaro. Not sure how it's going to work, but I certainly am not going to give up. I'm going to try not to give up. There's a time I've got to finish it in, by the way, Coca, did I tell you that? They sweep you off the course in six hours and 15 minutes. And I'm going to have to walk at least 16 of the miles is my guess. So I'm going to really have to hustle to beat that. But frankly, if I can get to the finish line, that will be success. That will be how I measure success. So Coke asked me to watch a movie called I Used to Be Famous. It's a movie about a member of a boy band that was hot. I wonder if it's based on like the Backstreet Boys or NSYNC or Menudo or the Jackson 5 or some other sort of boy band, but it's a, an English boy band. It takes place in the UK. And then all of a sudden, one of the members of the boy band has a great career and is all sorts of rich and famous. And one of the members of the boy band is not so rich, not so famous, not so recognized except by extreme fans. There is an actor in this movie who plays a neurodivergent character, and I didn't know what that meant. And it's played by a neurodivergent actor. That is apparently what we use as a word to describe some sort of disabilities like dyslexia or autism all sorts of others if you look it up but this is the new word so i'm going to use it and i'm going to be respectful of it the actor in this movie plays a young boy 16 years old let's say who's a drummer who somehow recognizes the old boy band loser guy and guess what together they make beautiful music and give each other a second chance. Love each other for who they are, a washed up boy band and a boy who doesn't get any possible attention because they perceive he is disabled. It is well above average. 
the end of the movie is just slightly below spectacular. It's the type of redemption story that you see every day that ends with why. <laughs> Sorry, Coca, but this one you do see all seven days. But the reason I suggest it, the music is decent. It's no John Carney. It's no Begin Again. It's no Sing Street. It's no Once. The music is fine. The acting by the old boy band guy who's now an adult, fine. The acting by the neurodivergent actor, spectacular. The feeling you get when the credits roll is warm, fuzzy, snuggly, cuddly. Who doesn't want that? I used to be famous. Check it out. So episode 666 today. On a serious note, can we talk about why people do certain things and why there isn't the type of punishment that existed back in the day of Gladiator or maybe Game of Thrones or back in the, in the torture days like the Princess Bride days? when you go to the torture machine and you get the life sucked out of you, but instead of being mostly dead, you're completely dead, and you can't go to Billy Crystal to eat a magic, magic piece of chocolate and somehow get revived and save Princess Buttercup? Why can't we be at a time? And I, you know, I'm not calling for an eye for an eye. I don't think. I'm not calling for capital punishment for this crime. I don't think. But I'll tell you what, there is no hell that is worthy of the 47 people who were arrested yesterday after a huge Department of Justice investigation. And here's what they did. During the COVID pandemic, there was money that was going to organizations around the country. This one specifically was in Minnesota. There are organizations who feed children who can't afford to eat. There's school plans. There are shelters that get food that is paid for by the government. There are organizations that take the money from the government, buy the food, and feed the children. That is more than worthy. That is an incredible organization except there were 47 people who were just arrested because they took money from the federal government and they didn't buy the food and they didn't feed the children. Instead, they bought cars, boats, homes, and property around the world. When the government asked for a list of the kids who were being fed, they submitted a list and every name was allegedly made up. What kind of devil are these people? What kind of hell do you think they should live in? What punishment do you think they should get? When asked to provide receipts for food so they could get more money, they made up receipts. We're buying 100 loaves of bread. Give me $1,000. We're buying 10,000 cans of spam. Give me $5 million. And then they didn't buy the spam or the bread, or the veggies, or the peanut butter, they took the money for themselves. My level of anger when Coca sent me this story yesterday, I couldn't believe it. There are people who take advantage of the PPP loans during COVID, right? There's companies who got money to try to keep their employees or use it to fire employees and figure out how to pay down other debt. There's people who commit fraud every single day, every day, stealing. But during COVID to take food out of the mouths of children to the tune of about $250 million worth of food that didn't go to kids? I double dare any of you to tell me that there is a bigger devil than that. It's not even fun to transfer and transition to pick of the day, but we have to. The show's going to go on. These people who were arrested, they're going to have a chance to defend themselves. They're going to have a chance to 
explain what happened. They're not guilty until proven guilty, and you know my stance on that. They are innocent until they're proven guilty. But if they are proven guilty, they can't starve in hell for enough years. Okay. You were concerned about the pick of the day last night. I get it. Why would the Astros, having clinched the West, beat the Rays? But they did. I told you they would. We're now 109 and 82. Astros over the Rays was a winner. Now, get out your pen. I've got a bunch of picks for you because of the fact we've got a sit down tomorrow, a mailbag Friday, and no show Monday. I'm giving you picks for the NFL weekend plus baseball tonight. Are you ready? Okay. Tonight, Miles, Nicholas, and the Cardinals are playing the Padres and Blake. Ian Snell. The Padres are hanging on, hanging on. The Cardinals are a juggernaut of victories. Believe me, Mikolas doesn't want to give up runs. He wants to get Pujols to the plate as many times as possible. Take the Cardinals over the Padres. That is a give me on Wednesday night. Then let's go into football. So last week in football, we saw some things that were staggering to me. And we talked about them earlier in the week. We talked about the comeback that the Dolphins had. We talked about the comeback that the Cardinals had. We talked about the comeback. There was a third team. Who did the the Ravens lost to the Dolphins? Oh, the Jets. The Jets comeback was spectacular over the Browns. What did teams do coming off a week like that. So a week later, if you're the Jets and you lose your next game, then you're just one and one and whatever, right? If the Dolphins come back and they lose, then it was great, Tua was amazing, he tied Dan Marino, it's a, it's the game of, it's a career game. But if you don't follow that up with a good performance, then it can become more of an outlier than the rule. So when you go into a week of practice after a devastating loss or a devastating win, you are doing one of two things. You're trying to keep it going or stop it from happening again. Stopping that bad feeling. So the week after becomes the most important week. Or in baseball, when you when you blow a lead as an example in the ninth inning, your closer blows a big save. You want to play the next day and you want a save situation and you want your closer to get the save so he can wipe that feeling right out of his head. Thursday night, there's an opportunity for the Browns They're playing the Steelers. The problem with the Browns is they've got the worst mojo possible. Forget the fact that they've got Deshaun Watson who's suspended until week 13. Forget the fact they have a bye week if you can't do the math. He'll come back against Houston. Forget the fact that what Jimmy Haslam, the owner, did has made the other owners so angry that the entire league is rooting against the Browns. If you are a Browns fan, and you still are with Watson on the team, I'm not sure why you are, but if you are, you are in for a year from Hades because the devil has hold of the Cleveland Browns, and the devil manifested himself in a fan And that actually bothered me. I really, we're going to talk about that right now because it was one of you asked me a question about it. And so you want to talk to Samson. You wanted to know what do you do when someone throws things at your players? Well, what happened in Cleveland after the comeback was complete, Jimmy Haslam was on the field thinking he was celebrating a victory. Then all of a sudden the Jets scored twice because the Cleveland Browns player made a mistake. In any case, there's an onside kick that's recovered. In any case, then another touchdown scored. In any case, the Jets win. Jimmy Haslam's walking off the field in disgust after the Jets scored the touchdown. And some devil in the stands threw a bottle at him. Who in their right mind thinks that's the plan? You see it in baseball. You see it in sports. Can you imagine like walking down the street and you're upset with something, you just decide to take a bottle and throw it at someone, that's called a crime. Assault with a deadly weapon. Yes, a bottle can be a deadly weapon. If that hits you in the head, hits you in the face, you can die because you find your victims as you find them. If your victim has an eggshell skull and you throw a bottle that hits him in the skull and their skull goes poof, guess what? You're a murderer. 
What is it about people when they're at games that they think they have the right to throw things at players, at owners, at executives? What, because you're jealous? Because you're angry? Because you lost a bet? Because you think it's your right to watch a victory? Who in the hell do you think you are? You can hate Jimmy Haslam as much as you want. You can hate me. You can hate anybody. But you're going to assault us, throw bottles, and then expect to have no repercussions? How about jail? How would that be? How about soap a rope? I think Jimmy Haslam is disgraceful for signing Deshaun Watson to a $230 million deal. You've heard my view of Danny Snyder, Jerry Jones. I like Jerry for also saying he's the GM. Might as well be the GM. You've heard me be critical of people and complimentary of people. What would make you think that the people I'm critical of deserve to be hit by a bottle or a flying object? In what world are you living if you think that's the appropriate next step? And if you see someone doing it and you're not calling security or tackling the guy yourself, though I wouldn't do that unless you're bigger than I am. Like if you're coca size, you better tackle someone if they're throwing a bottle on the field and throwing it at a player. You want to boo, boo. You want to give the finger? I don't think it's ideal, but give the finger. You want to yell, scream, heckle, I'm in. Keep your hands to yourself and stop throwing objects on the field or at players, owners, referees. I've seen more bad calls than all of you will combined just because I've watched more games. I've wanted to yell at umpires. I've gone to the umpire's room to approach umpires. Throwing things? Like that's your way of expressing your displeasure? Are you that inarticulate that the, all you can do is throw things? It is infuriating to me that people behave this way. I guess our whole episode is about devils. Devils who can be physical, devils who do things like fraud, the corporate greed. Wow, come to think of it. There's a lot of devils out there in this episode 666. Jimmy Haslam should not have to watch out at the Thursday night game. Jimmy Haslam should be able to watch his team lose to the Steelers, and that's it. He should be able to be in his suite, on the field, on the sidelines, in the stands, and not have to worry about a bottle being thrown at his head. What he does need to worry about is his team stinks, and he deserves for his team to go 0 and 17. The Steelers are plus four and a half versus the Browns, and we're taking the Steelers and the points. I am trying to imagine a world of heaven where the Browns are 0 and 11 when Deshaun Watson takes the field. Yummy. There's only one thing that would have been better would be them being 11 and 0, and then Deshaun Watson going 0 and 6. That'd be interesting. But now it looks like I have to root for the 0 and 11 and then just see what happens for the other six. So that's the Thursday night game. The Steelers have a problem. It's not good when you've got a top drafted quarterback. He doesn't like throwing the ball downfield. You don't make big plays. You're missing Big Ben. I'm not sure who would ever miss Big Ben off the field, but certainly on the field, the Steelers are saying, wow, this post Big Ben is not so ideal. But you're getting four and a half from the Browns and we're taking that four and a half. Sunday, the Ravens are going to recover. Coca, close your ears. Turn them off right now. The Ravens, three over the Patriots. The Ravens are going to crush the Patriots in a way that is going to make Bill Belichick throw his hooded sweatshirt in the laundry permanently. He's going to want to take a scissors to his sleeves and not stop until he does holes around his chest and belly button. That's the embarrassment that Lamar Jackson, the Ravens, after last week, are going to rebound and put on the Patriots. So that's my pick for Sunday. What about Monday? Monday's an interesting game. The Giants are heading to London in a couple weeks to play the Packers. They're playing the Cowboys. The Cowboys are getting two and a half points from the Giants who are trying to go to 3-0. and Jerry Jones is going to pay attention to that line. I don't think he gambles on the games. I really don't. But he knows, just like all the players know what the line is. I like when players say, oh, I don't know what the line is. Believe me, he knows what the line is. 
Jerry Jones cannot believe that he is Dak Prescott or not an underdog versus the Giants. I want the Giants to be undefeated heading into London. I think that would be CAF, not Challenged Athletes Foundation, but cool is, yeah, that, explicit. Take the Cowboys plus two and a half. The Giants could win by one. That'd be cool. But I think the Cowboys have a better chance. So our picks of the day are of the following. Wednesday, Cardinals in baseball over the Padres. That's the money line. Thursday, take the Steelers plus four and a half versus the Browns. And don't throw anything when the Browns lose. Sunday, Ravens three over Pats. Monday, Cowboys plus two and a half versus Giants. And we'll be back live Tuesday. Don't you worry. Okay. To end the show, I want to go through a Sarver wait to see. A Sarver wait to see is the following. Robert Sarver is the owner of the Phoenix Suns, the guy who's suspended for a year. There has been an unbelievable uproar. We've talked about it on Lebitard. We're going to talk about it again uh, on tomorrow's Lebitard, uh, which is a Thursday, or maybe that's two days from now, or Thursday. What day is today, Coca? Today's Tuesday the 21st. So two days. No, it's Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. Thank you. Stop. Okay. Three, six, nine. We've talked about Sarver on Nothing Personal this week, last week. We're going to talk about it again on Lebitard tomorrow. We talked about it last week on Lebitard. It's a big deal. Players are speaking up. LeBron James, Chris Paul, Adam Silver may or may not have made a mistake. I told you that Adam Silver did exactly what the owners told him to do. There's no audio. There's no video. Sarver is not going to be kicked out of the game. I've said it. Well, Draymond Green has now entered the fray. Bless his soul. He's got a podcast that's good. Listen to it. Not instead of nothing personal, maybe in addition to nothing personal. And he is calling on a vote. He is an employee. He's a player. And what he's saying is, I want the owners to take a vote on whether or not to oust Robert Sarver. And I want to see where every owner votes. And for the owners who vote to let him stay in the game, I am going to embarrass them. He didn't say that part, but that's what he means. I want to identify these owners. Just out of curiosity, do you think that the NBA owners are going to take that vote and then publicize who voted where? Do you think that Adam Silver, before suspending Sarver for one year, did not take a straw vote of the owners to see whether or not the votes were there. You need three quarters in order to make him sell and force him to sell. Draymond, do you actually think that you've come up with something that is mind boggling, that no one else has thought of, that you pointing out that Robert Sarver is the devil is going to all of a sudden, poof, it's Epiphany Tuesday. We're gonna vote on this. Why, I can't believe we didn't think of that. Thank you, Draymond. We're holding the vote right now. I understand his disappointment. I understand the concern a year from now when Sarver comes back that that could be weird because do you become a non-misogynist? It's not like being a drug addict or alcohol addict or pill addict. You could maybe get sober and clean, right? There are plenty of stories of people who get their lives together and then become spokespeople. Shout out to someone like a Rex Chapman. One of the great redemption stories of our time. What a wonderful, beautiful story. Is Robert Sarver over a year? All the classes he's gonna take? He's gonna come back and say, you know what? I'm still old and white, but now I'm not racist and I really am okay with women and fully respectful of them. Okay, wait to see. Not the official wait to see. But if that's what you're thinking is gonna happen, it's probably not. But that doesn't matter. That still will not mean there's enough votes for him to sell the team. He may sell it on his own accord, but not because of a vote by the owners. And when your employees ask you in management to vote on something that is like cutting off one of the limbs of management, which is what it would be for owners to eat one of themselves, they're not going to do it. So I'm going to give you an official way to see Draymond. And that's what we do every day or most days of the 666 episodes. 
and we'll follow up. Unlike the other people who have podcasts, we will follow up when we're right and when we're wrong. Like on September 16th, we had to wait to see that Sarver wasn't going to sell. I'm going to give you a wait to see on September 21st that there will not be a vote to oust Sarver as Draymond Green has requested. It's simply not going to happen. And the reason is that it's just business. This is nothing personal.